Praise God. I uh, was thinking about my age and getting old quick. Miserable, dreaded birthday coming up here is not too long. And, uh, I uh, begin to think today about the way things used to be and the way things are. And uh, uh, the things I physically could do and the things that I physically can't do. Uh, I couldn't preach without my glasses. Yes, I mean, I could probably preach, but I couldn't read my notes. Uh, I didn't know what, I never wore glasses except sunglasses till I was 45. Um, I got to think about all that stuff. But one thing I did think about is I thank God for the experiences. Because there's a lot of things different about the way I think. You just learn a little. It, it, it's a shame. I don't know. I, I just, I wish I could still jump. I wish I could still do some of the things physically I used to, but I thank God. I don't think I want to go back. That's too tough. I was too stupid. And uh, I'm not very smart now, but I'm a lot smarter than I used to be. And I just don't think I want to go back and do that again. How about you? Everybody said, if I could just be 18 years old again, I don't think I could think of anything more miserable than that. And I know my mom can't, so... But uh, I just thank God for who he is, what he's, he's been faithful. He's always been there in my darkest days when I made my biggest mistakes, when I have uh, felt the lowest of the low. Whenever he should have walked away, he didn't. He's just there. And I don't know about it, but when they were singing those songs, I just closed my eyes and I just felt him there. Everywhere. He's always present. He's not just omnipresent, but he's manifest present. He he wants to show himself. He's not just God that's everywhere. He's not just the omnipresent God, but he's the manifest present God, if you'll just ask him. He's as close as the mention of his name, and when you ma- mention his name, he manifests himself. When you close your eyes and you think about him, he, he he's so jealous of your attention. He's so hungry for your attention. When you close your eyes and you mention his name, he's just there. He manifests himself there. They started singing that song, and, and just it just he just showed up because he loves that. Thankful for the presence of the Lord. Thankful to be part of His kingdom. Matthew chapter five, and I'm going to ask you a question before before we go there. What is the single hardest thing in the whole world about living for God? It's easy. Well, let's think about it. what is the sing. When I tell you what it is, you're going to say, "Yeah, I knew that." What's the single greatest, the most difficult part? If you had to narrow it down to one thing, if if there was one thing that I wish that wasn't in there that is in there, what would it be? No. That's that's part of it, but no, that's close. That's that'd be in the top ten. Just think about it. Just for say, anybody got another idea? That that's warm, huh? That's that's pretty close. That's that's real close. That's that's probably number two on the list, but it's akin to number one. The hardest thing in the world to do, the hardest thing in the Bible, the hardest thing on the planet, the most difficult part of Christianity, is to love your enemies. Is there anything harder than that? Loving somebody that hates you, doing good to somebody that just slapped you in the jaw? Is that the hardest thing? Is there anything harder than that? Nope. And I hate that that's in the Bible. Because my last name is Whitley. And and, and we don't suffer enemies well. My stepdaughter, there was a stalker chasing my stepdaughter, and today if I could have got my hands on him, some old, dirty old man chasing my 18-year-old girl around, and I was not happy. Found out that he's a, he's, that's got to be an exclusion clause. 
And I'm like, Lord, why am I teaching what I'm teaching when I just really want to get to that guy? And I chased him around for 30 minutes today, and thank God I didn't catch him. But I got to love that guy. Love him to death, Marty said. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, well, let's talk about it. So I've already confessed that I, I'm. That this is a do as I say, not as I do type message. So let's get this together. It's got to be done. It's got to be done, and it's hard. So let's talk about it. Matthew chapter 5, verse number 43. We'll go down through verse number 48. You have heard that it was said, and I want you to stop right here. You shall love your neighbor. The Bible says, remember the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God. And there's another commandment just like you got to love your neighbor as yourself. But this goes, to, and we've been talking about love, love, love the last three weeks. You've heard it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Go ahead, and we're going to move quickly all the way through 48. But I say to you, love your enemies. Who's talking here, by the way? Anybody got a Bible that's got red ink? Is that red? Jesus said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. How many of you are already out? How many, how many of you already need prayer? Do good to those who hate you. And pray, I do pray, Lord. Speak them out, Lord. Pray for those who spitefully use you to persecute you. 46, stay with me, Seth. We're going to move quick. Oh, I'm sorry. That you're right. I'm wrong. That you may be sons of your. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. You pray for the. Back up a scripture. Back up to 44. Love your, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Why? So that you can be sons of your Father in heaven. If you don't do that, are you a son or a daughter? For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. They were the worst of the worst, and they, they were all crooks. They collected more than they should have. And so he said, even tax collectors love people that love them. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Don't even the tax collectors do that? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. You want to be perfect. There's only one rule for being perfect. He said, if you love your enemy, you'll be perfect like he's perfect. Why did he say that? Because that's the hardest thing. If you get all that, you got the rest of it figured out. Wow. I'm a little stunned by that. I don't know about you, but I, I question my walk with God a little bit. Can I do better? Can we do better? Let's talk about it. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Jesus said, you're going to be perfect like your father is perfect. And he measured perfection by how you treat your enemy. <laughs> Did you hear me? The way perfection is measured in the kingdom of God is by how you treat your enemy. Well, my enemy deserves it. The Bible didn't say, ask whether or not they deserved it. He said, you do good to those that do bad to you. You treat people good that treat you bad. People that hate you, you love them, and you do good to them, and you buy them Christmas presents. Because if you just buy Christmas presents for people that love you, then what? So perfection, and if you don't hear anything else I say, and if you need to leave early, just write this down before you leave. But we measure perfection in the kingdom of God by how we love our enemy. And the Bible says if we love our enemies, we're perfect. If you're going to be perfect, let's go to Matthew chapter 19 and verse 21. Let's talk about perfection again. Jesus said if you want to be perfect, 
Go sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. James chapter 3 and verse number 2 says, If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man. Colossians chapter 3, 14, And above all these things, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. So, if you look at all these scriptures, they had to do with how you dealt with other people and how you treated other people and what you did for other people. And if you want to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, give to the poor. And all of these have to deal with perfection, but the, the highest mark of perfection is how you treat your enemy. Uh, I don't know if, if we can do it or not without intervention, without God helping us. I really don't know that... that Let's talk about it. What do you think? Let me ask you. Do you think that's spiritual? Do you think you need God's spirit to do that? Or do you think that's something we do in order to gain God's spirit? I, I, I'm going to probably disagree with just about everybody in the room and say we do this first. Because the Bible says we come to the altar and we ask we want God to forgive us and we've got something our, against our brother that we've got to first get up and go reconcile with our brother and then we come back to the altar. And so I think, I know love's supernatural and it comes from God, but I, the forgiveness, which is the biggest part of perfection, which is the biggest part, which is number two on the list, Steve, that comes before God touches us. And you don't really have to forgive somebody unless they're at least partially your enemy. Is that correct? So, uh, let's read a couple of scriptures. I'm going to skip down Seth a little bit. I've got too many scriptures here. And I, Luke chapter 6, we'll do that. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? If you read this chapter, he's talking about dealing with people that are unthankful. He's talking about dealing with people that are unkind, dealing with people that are unjust, and how we should treat them. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness or iniquity. We're casting out devils in your name. We're prophesying in your name. We're doing all these things in your name. What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that, but you haven't met the mark or the measure of a true Christian because the true Christian is measured by love. God is a spirit and God is love. Those are two things. You can read that in, uh, I believe that's John chapter 4 and then also in 1 John chapter 4. That's why I remember that. John chapter 4 deals with God being love and then 1 John chapter 4, or God being a spirit and 1 John chapter 4 deals with God being love. And you can read about that. And God is a spirit and that spirit is love. In Romans chapter 8 and verse number 9 says this, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. The Spirit of Christ is the Spirit of love. And so we have to have that Spirit of love. The ultimate display of the Spirit of love is to love your enemy. It's easy to love your brother. It's easy to love your sister. It's easy, to, it's easy for me to love my kids. It's just natural for me to love my kids. It's natural. It's easy. Uh, it's easy for me to, uh, to, to love my mama. I mean, I just love my mom, and, and that's just the way it's supposed to be. That's not hard for me. I don't have to get up and think about that. I don't have to forgive her. I don't have to work hard at that. It's just natural for me to love my mom. But that guy stalking my daughter, it's hard. It's not natural for me to love that dude. And 
so we got to be, we got to, the, but the will of God is for us to love one another and to love everybody else, to love your neighbor, to love your family, to love your enemies, and it's called perfection, and it's called Christianity, and if you don't have that, are we really what God wants. Well, I shook the preacher's hand and I signed the roll and I accepted Christ as my Savior and I was baptized and I did all this and I did 10 Hail Marys or whatever I'm supposed to do. Do you love your enemy? I, I did Acts I, I did Acts 2.38, Matthew 28.19 in the Romans Road, all just to be sure. Then I went to confession. Love your enemy. You could read it, and you might want to write it down, and we won't take the time to read it. We'll skip through it. But the whole chapter of John, chapter 15, John deals with love a lot. But the whole, especially the first 17 verses. But I'm just going to read uh, a couple of those verses. Now, verse number 4 says, Abide in me, and I in you. That's good. So God wants to live, us to live in him. And when we live in him, he lives in us. And then verse number 10 says, If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So how do we abide in him? We abide in him by keeping his commandments. And when we keep his commandments, we abide in his love. Just as I kept my father's commandments, and I abide in his love, because God is love. Are you with me? And then verse number 12 says, this is my commandment. If you keep my commandments, you abide in my love. Just as I kept my Father's commandments, not abide in his love. This is my commandment, that you have loved one to another as I have loved you. Did he love his enemies? Did he pray for those that despitefully used them? He prayed for those who crucified him. His last prayer that he prayed was for his enemies. The last prayer he prayed was, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That was his last prayer. So his final words or his final prayer was praying for his enemies. Uh, and then verse number 15, verse number 14, excuse me, says, You are my friends if you do that. I'm a friend of God. We sing the hair off that song. Well, how are we the friend of God? By keeping his commandments. We abide in his love by keeping, well, what is his commandment? That you love one another as I have loved you. And then we talked about this Sunday, and I'm going to go back real quickly in John chapter 13, verse number 34 and verse number 35, a new commandment. We talked about this Sunday. I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. Verse 35, by this all will know that you are my disciples, that you love, have love one for another. But what we're doing is we're taking that to the next level tonight. And say, not just loving, it's easier for me to love Tim. He's just a kind-hearted, simple, uh, just an easy person to, to get along with and to like. It's easy for me to love Tim. We get along great. We've never had a harsh word. That's just natural. I can walk up to Tim and say, Tim, I love you and hug his neck and, I, and, and say it with all my heart and he'll believe it. That's easy for me to do. But can I take it to that person that has spitefully used me? Can I take it to that person who's gossiped about me? Can I take it to that person who divorced me? Can I take it to that person who took money out of the mouth, uh, out of the, out, uh, took food out of my baby's mouth by taking money out of my pocket? Can I, can I take that same measure to him and love that person as easily as I loved him? And there's not anybody in here that can say yes to that with the same conviction you can say yes to you love Brother Tim. But that's where, that's the target we're aiming for. I'm going to tell you, that's a hard target. Can I say it again? Can you love that person with a self-sacrificing love that divorced you? That ran around on you? That stole from you?
there is not an amen to be had in that. First John chapter two, verse three through five. Now, now, am I right? Is this the hardest thing in the Bible, or what? Now, by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Verse three. Uh, he who says I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. He that he says, I know him and does not keep his commandment is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected. There we go back to that perfect word again. By this we know that we are in him. And what is his commandment? Number one commandment is to love God. Number two commandment is to love your neighbor. And then he takes that to a whole different level when he says love your enemy. And the Bible says, in a per- boy, I'm... I, I said I wasn't going to go here, but the Bible says that a person's enemies are often those of what? His own household. <clears throat> Verse 9 of 1 John chapter 2, same chapter. He that saith he is in light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Verse 11, all this is good. I just can't read all these and be done. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. You're real likely to stub your toe. Arrogance, pride, and such were some of you. The problem we run into is the more God blesses us, the easier it is to become prideful. And that's sometimes what we we may live. The reason Lazarus just had crumbs and dogs to lick his sore may have been because he lived just above the starvation line because that's the only level that he could be saved at. I believe God wants to bless his people, but he's not going to bless you and let you go to hell. He's not going to bless you and let you become proud and judgmental. I believe sometimes the reason we go through things is so we humble ourselves. I know I've been through some humbling things, and it makes me look at everybody differently. I've been humbled, and I look at people that are going through things a whole lot. I don't judge them anymore. I'm like, oh, my goodness, is there so much? Oh, oh, oh. I can start squalling with them instead of saying, well, bless God, you should have known better. Because God knew the kind of people we were and loved us and died for us anyway. So we've got to be really careful. we got to be really careful because sometimes people come into an experience with God and that experience with God, the Pharisees, and you know, I, I read something today that somebody sent me said, uh, we pick on Pharisees and we and we hate people that hate people. And, and then we become our own Pharisee because we hate Pharisees. <laughs> it's, a, it's a trap. There's always a hate trap. There's always a hate trap in every relationship, in every marriage, in every uh, oh, job, in, in, in every school, in, in every relationship that you have. There's a trap. There's a hate trap. There's a, there's a trap that will get you lost so fast it will make your head spin. It, it, it's not probably not going to be the big things. You're, you're probably, I mean, you're probably not going to go out and, and, and rape and pillage and molest and steal and do all those things. But the devil's going to set a little hate trap in every relationship that you have. got to be careful. Paul 
was the last scripture I gave you, Seth? Do you know? First John 2? Good. We just read that about hate bringing blindness, right? When you hate, you live in darkness, and you're blind. You can't see where you're going. And love is like a light that pierces the darkness. 1 John 4 and 20, and we'll go down through 21. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, we just read a scripture almost just like this in chapter 2 of 1 John. He is a liar, for he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must, everybody say must, love his brother also. So let me summarize. A person who says he loves God but not, does not love his enemy or does not love his brother becomes a liar, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. That's in Revelation chapter 21, if you want to look that up, in verse number 8. And the, the, the way Jesus is going to know those that are his children, those that are part of the bride, those that have the same spirit that he has, and his spirit is the spirit of love, and his spirit's going to abide in us and will manifest itself in us as we keep his commandments. His commandments are that we should love. And whether or not we can do that without his spirit in us, I don't know. But we must forgive. We must fix it with our enemies before we can find forgiveness for our own sin. We've got to be careful with that. Jesus loved people, and I think this addresses what Marty said real well. Jesus loved everybody without questioning whether they deserved it or not. He loved the woman at the well. He loved the woman they caught in the very act of adultery. He loved Lazarus, uh, the, he, the tax collect, or Zacchaeus, the tax collector. He, he, he loved the unlovable. He loved the people he wasn't even supposed to be in contact with. He loved the people that lived uh, alternate lifestyles. He loved those people. He loved the lepers. He loved those that were diseased. He loved them, and he never... Uh, questioned whether or not they deserved it. He just loved them, period. That's hard to do. Let's read it real quick, a couple of scriptures. Luke chapter 6, and I'll be through in a couple of minutes here. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who spitefully use you. And I'll finish by going back to the same scripture. Love your enemies, do good. You could read, let's go ahead, let's read down, folks, let's go ahead. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, listen to these rules. To him who strikes you on the one cheek, offer the other also. And from him who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Can I put that in Arkansas English? If a guy steals your shirt, give him your britches. <laughs> go home in your skivvies. Give to everyone who asks of you, and from him who takes away your goods. <laughs> I'm not there, God help me. Give to everyone who asks. That's okay. That's, not, that's okay. But he who steals from you, don't even go ask him to give it back. Hey man, you remember that hammer you borrowed back in '77? You think I could get that back? And just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. But if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. We've heard this before. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. 34. And if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive back, what credit is that to you for even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much back? It's called bankers. <laughs> Just thought it was a good thing. But <laughs> love your enemies, do good and lend, hoping for nothing in return, and your reward will be great and you will be 
sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. Therefore be merciful, just as your father also. I, can I tell you something? We're all unthankful and evil. And he's kind to all of us. Judge not. It's not your job. We're pros at it. We have PhDs in it. Judge not and you shall not be judged. Condemn not and you shall not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And somebody say amen. amen. Give and it will be given to you. <laughs> Good and bad. We love to quote this scripture. We just don't want to read the 11 before it. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will men put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Your forgiveness is directly directly proportional to how much you forgive. The same measuring cup that you give to others is a measuring cup God's going to give back to you. Except he's going to good measure, press down, shake it together, running over. I don't know about you, but that's pretty good scripture right there. Love your enemies, do good. Lend, hoping for nothing again. Your reward will be great. You'll be called the children of the highest. Give to the unthankful. Give to the evil. Be merciful and don't judge. Be merciful and don't condemn. Be merciful and forgive. Then he sums it all up with this one. Give and it shall be given to you. Good measure. Press down, shaking together, running over. Thank God. What will be on display on Judgment Day will be your love. We could say, well, I did this and I didn't do that and I went somewhere I wasn't supposed to go and I wore something I wasn't supposed to wear and I said something I wasn't supposed to say. God's going to look past a whole lot of that stuff. But he won't look past. You hear me tonight, and I just proved it in Scripture. He will not look past your lack of love or forgiveness for everybody. Your lack of mercy will cause you to be judged by him. The mercy that you show others is the mercy he's going to show you on Judgment Day. Is that what that said? The mercy, the way you treat people that don't deserve tr good treatment is the way God's going to treat you because you don't deserve it either, honey. And the way you treat those people is the way he's going to treat you that day. So the questions he's going to ask you on Judgment Day, How do you feel about so-and-so that took that from you? How do you feel about so-and-so that divorced you? How do you feel, how do you feel about so-and-so that fired you? How do you feel so about so-and-so that lied on you and gossiped on you? Those are the questions you're going to hear on Judgment Day. He already knows the answers because he's watched our display. I have an adopted son. His name is Curtis. Curtis is 33 years old. Curtis spent the last decade in prison. The only day Curtis has been out of prison in the last 11 years is the day he went to a funeral. Curtis, one Sunday night during church when we was doing the very best we could, I'd done everything I could do for Curtis, everything I could do for Curtis, tried my best to help him. He 
broke into my pickup truck, stole my wallet while I was in church preaching on Sunday morning. Stole my wallet and stole my 45 Smith and Wesson 1911. Took my wallet and went and charged everything he could charge before I could find out, took the cash I had and spent it. Took the, my pistol and went and robbed two hotels so he could buy drugs for him and his family. I just got a phone call before church that was a test of what I was about to say. Curtis gets out on parole in January and needs a place to live. He has to have a place to live until his parole stint's over. His sister called me because he was afraid to write me and ask me. He got a, his sister got a letter from him and said, can I come and live with you? And I said, no, you tell him to come and live with me. At least until we can get him someplace to live. There you go. He may rob from me again, but he may be the best thing that ever had. He may, he may be completely, who knows? But is that the right thing to do? As long as I protect him. There are things I can protect him with that. It's not easy. Let me ask you a question. I said that. I believe me, I'm the furthest from perfect of anybody in this room. The furthest, the furthest, the furthest. I know what a rotten scoundrel I am. I'm the furthest. But is there something like that in your life that you could do better at? I'm afraid if I hadn't have been studying this lesson a little bit, I might have said something different. But whenever she said that, it just quickened me. I've got to do the right thing here no matter what. It ain't about him. It ain't about what he did. It's about how I react and how I treat him. And he's got the potential to be a real good boy. Those of you who know him, he's got the potential to be a real good boy. The only chance he has is if I just keep loving him no matter what. You got the chance to be a real good husband. You got a chance to be a real good wife. You got a chance to be a real good employee. You got a chance to be a real good son or daughter. We just got to keep treating him. It's awful quiet in here. So can I go back to the theme of 2013? Can we do better? Next Wednesday night, we're going to talk about the differences of how they treated enemies in the Old Testament and how you treat an enemy in the New Testament. And what's the difference between the Old and the New Testament? The old rugged cross makes a difference. We want to treat people like they treated them in the Old Testament. When I read these scriptures, the stark, unbelievable difference. And that's what we're going to talk about next Wednesday night. I'm excited about it. Glad you came to church tonight. Would you stand with us? Can I tell you where I got this lesson? I was old brother Haney, and I'll try not to squall. I was talking about him today. He was general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church and my dear, 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 dear friend. Lost his life to brain cancer and gained eternity in heaven and just was a prince of a man. And uh, he was uh, <clears throat> very close to me. Uh, he would call me and say, hey, or he'd have his assistant call me and say, Brother Haney's got a plane ticket waiting on you. Why don't you fly up here and spend the day with him? Now, he'd call me in the morning and want me to drop everything, just fly to St. Louis and sit with him. And I don't, we just sat there, went to eat. We, we went to terrible old people restaurants. Ed and Kay's and stuff like that. And <laughs> uh, but anyway, I loved him and and I was just confessing about somebody that had done me wrong. And I was just I could talk to him about anything and I was just confessing some of this terrible stuff that was going on. And he got up and he went to his bookshelf. made me these copies of the Bible study, his
his wife had written on forgiving your enemies. And that's what I just read now. Fixed my wagon pretty good. And every time I get uh, a little upset about stuff, I kind of go back and dig out Sister Haney's notes. And these were her notes to me. I'll never forget when I got them. And I, I'll never forget the lesson I learned that day that God wants to make us rulers. God wants to make us great in the kingdom of God. God wants to use us in mighty, mighty ways. But he can't do it if we don't love everybody. If we got prejudice in our heart, if we got hatred in our heart towards somebody, God just can't pick us when it comes to picking his team. He just can't pick us because he runs too big a chance to ruin this thing he gave his life for. He just can't pick us on his team until we get this part figured out. And I want to be on his team. How about you? Because i got a feeling that he's going to win. <laughs> so let's practice that. Could you just lift your hands to him tonight? Lord, I love you. You've been good to us. Your ways are so far above our ways, but we're so thankful for your ways. We're so thankful for your kindness and your mercy that you've extended to us in your own blood. We pray, God, that that spirit that was in you rests in us and rests heavy on us, convicts us of our sin, our shortcomings when it comes to loving our brothers and loving our enemies. Help us to do better starting this moment. Help these words spoken tonight resonate in our ears and our minds and our hearts until it causes change in our lives, change for the better. So we can be on your team. We can be a part of your kingdom. We can uh, rule and reign with you for eternity in the spirit of love and mercy. And we, we thank you for the privilege to be in your house on Wednesday night. It's a great privilege. We don't take it lightly. Thankful for your word. Pray that you bless everybody that's here abundantly tonight. And everybody said in Jesus' name.